The title of this seminar is Weaving Scars. The scars that we all carry represent residual traces and memories of past events in our lives. The sites upon which we build works of architecture are also composed of scars. Each scar represents a fragment of an underlying story about how a site has transformed over time. The hidden stories of a site's identity can be reawakened when these scars are woven together by the architect. Scars that appear upon the face of a building are called palimpsests. When observing these scars, architects see the story of how a particular site has transformed over time. In the natural landscape, cataclysmic events from centuries ago can remain visible as permanent scars upon the landscape. Man-made tragedies like half-buried streams can remain forever visible as open scars upon the land. James Joyce once wrote in the margins of his novel Ulysses that places remember events. A tree branch cracking in the wind, fragments of stone tumbling down a hillside, the natural environment falls out in whispers and whimpering groans, its unique form of storytelling audible to us all if we simply pause and listen. When commencing an architectural design, the architect begins by investigating how the scars upon a site can be woven together to convey the underlying story of that place. A work of architecture can enhance our awareness of those scars and the underlying stories that they hold. But scars represent only small fragments of a greater tale. So telling a story through fragments requires that the architect takes on a role similar to a museum curator. In museums, when presented with an array of fragments from a past civilization, for example, a museum curator decides how to sequence and hierarchically arrange the fragments so that a particular story about that civilization will emerge. And depending on how the fragments are arranged, the story can dramatically change. This storytelling capability of an architect is referred to as narrative or allegorical architecture. A narrative work of architecture can reveal stories as universal as climate change. Or for example, a work of architecture can even convey a very intimate story about a local neighborhood. In this seminar, I describe research investigations that I conducted with my postgraduate architecture students that look at ways in which architecture, when designed allegorically as a machine, can weave together scars that represent important underlying stories about a site, stories that we need to remember and safeguard for future generations. Just as a story in a book is presented over time as we read it, a work of architecture can present a story over time as we move through and around a building. A machine can also convey a story because it performs a function over time. When a work of architecture is generated from an allegorical machine, its storytelling capabilities are enhanced. And most importantly, the building will no longer look normal or expected. Conceiving architecture as an allegorical machine challenges the work of architecture to take on new imaginative forms while simultaneously safeguarding important stories about a place that we need to remember. In all of the following examples, the concept of the machine as architecture is examined by my postgraduate students as a storytelling device. The first four speculative architectural design projects share a common theme. They each tell a story about how the machine has been responsible for enhancing our prosperity, while simultaneously the machine has been leading to our destruction. The students use the machine as architecture to represent both the habitable sanctuary that protects us from a dystopian condition as well as the technological advancements that have caused the dystopian condition.
In the first design-led research experiment, titled The Stranger by postgraduate student Chris Young, architecture is composed of five integrated machines that are metaphorically used to represent time, place, and society. A camera obscura, a loom, a theodolite, a compass, and a clock. These five machines were each translated into architectural spaces to house the stranger. When combined into a single work of architecture, they provide a utopian architectural habitat. But the stranger who inhabits this machine-like architectural construct fails to realize that the actions of the machine, which make it environmentally self-sufficient to live inside, are also the actions that are destroying the natural environment outside. The allegorical architectural project is sited on a severely scarred strip mining site where the hydroponic machine is also the machine stripping the earth and the stone from the landscape. The second design-led research experiment, titled Topology of a Phantom City, and led by postgraduate student Hamish Beatty, draws on surrealism through apparent contradictions, unexpected juxtapositions, and distant realities. This experiment reflects on a contemporary environmental crisis relating to the inhabitants of Burundi Dump in Papua New Guinea, where populations of slum dwellers representing a wide variety of cultures are in constant flux. In the allegorical architectural design for the inhabitants of this toxic landfill, time and place are fluctuating and fluid, representing the fragmented and distorted lives of slum dwellers in a dystopian 21st century outpost. The architectural habitats are machines that continually change form as they build themselves from the debris filling the toxic dump site. The apparent contradiction is that this network of waste pickers who recycle salvageable toxic waste to survive inhabit an architectural sanctuary that is a machine composed of the very toxic waste from which they are seeking sanctuary. This allegorical architectural experiment argues that yesterday's future has already become today's present, and for us to survive, it is now the role of architecture to provide for today's tomorrow. The third design-led research experiment, titled The Shadow Archive and led by postgraduate student Callum McCorkendale, also uses the machine as architecture to explore contradictions, unexpected juxtapositions, and distant realities. This experiment reflects on what might happen in a dystopian future as digital hardware becomes progressively obsolete and we eventually lose our capability to access historic information stored in outdated formats. It proposes to reprogram the cooling tower of an abandoned coal-burning power plant in Charleroi, Belgium as a digital archive for safeguarding evolving digital technologies. The apparent contradiction in this allegorical architectural project is that an example of industrial architecture that was a major cause of climate change is used to safeguard our digital heritage once climate change has led to the collapse of mankind. The architecture is conceived as a machine that continually gathers digital information from all around the globe. On the one hand, this architectural machine acts as an important and benevolent global library. But on the other hand, it becomes the new big brother capable of watching our every move while it waits for our demise. The fourth design-led research experiment, titled The Machine Stops and led by postgraduate student William Dutois, reawakens a tale of environmental devastation in Maystown, New Zealand, which was virtually uninhabited until hundreds of stamper batteries, now rusting in the wilderness, were imported into the region to crush stone during the 1860 gold rush. The contradiction in this allegorical architectural project is that the same habitable architectural machines that brought enormous prosperity to the region were also responsible for its environmental devastation. In this design-led research experiment, the allegorical tale is told from the perspective of the architectural machine, a stamper battery, as well as from the perspective of six environmental sites, the mineshaft, an aerial cableway, a water race, schist tailings, 
a redirected stream, and traces of an earlier battery swept away in a flood. The elements of machines enter into dialogues with the elements of the natural site, and together they convey this complex story about prosperity and devastation. The works of architecture that William designed for the site are all composed of pieces of the abandoned machines and materials taken from the landscape. The program for this project is a campsite where the architecture as a machine tells the story of the site with the remains of the stamper battery visible in the distance. The four experiments that I've just described all use the machine as architecture to tell a universal story about how the machine and related technologies are leading to the destruction of the natural environment and perhaps even mankind. In the next experiments, I asked my postgraduate students to each select a real site that represents an important story that needs to be preserved. Their designs for machine-based architecture located on these sites tell the story each site has to tell. The next allegorical research experiment is titled Charting Null Island, led by postgraduate student Thomas Zhu. This allegorical project explores the location in the Atlantic Ocean where zero degrees longitude and zero degrees latitude converge. And it is one of the most important navigational sites in the world. The site of Null Island has a permanent ocean buoy floating on the horizon line, which sends out navigational signals around the globe. They call this site Null Island, which means an island where no island actually exists. How can you design architecture for a place that exists but does not exist? A place that is both real and unreal. Tom began by designing a work of architecture that in plan appears like a mapping device where the architecture and the map are one and the same. He then encouraged the architecture to rise up out of the page and become the machine that is drawing the map. As the machine began to build itself higher and higher, Tom wondered what it might be like if the giant ocean boy is actually the very top of a half kilometer tall machine-like work of architecture that extends all the way down to the seabed. Tom proposed that the movements of his machine at the surface of the ocean might create the waves, while the movements of the machine on the seabed would create the shifting patterns of sand. And halfway in between, the movements of the machine would create all the ocean currents. Inside the giant machine are chambers that observe all the movements of the ocean from its surface down to the ocean floor. Tom envisioned his mythical work of architecture as a device that records and collects all of the objects carried by the ocean currents and waves. These items represent the memories that the sea has held over time, and the machine becomes an archive or collection device for all of these memories. Thousands of years ago, this great collection device was filled with tiny shells and beautiful pieces of coral, but now it is filled completely with crushed plastic and broken glass rusty metal, and abandoned fishing nets. As more and more of these man-made items are collected, they eventually prevent the giant machine from rotating anymore, and the currents of the ocean stop. Once the ocean currents no longer flow, global weather changes. The natural environmental systems of the globe that had once been in perfect balance all begin to collapse. Charting Null Island is an architectural project about a place that is real and unreal, and the unreal work of architecture tells a story that is in fact very real indeed.
next allegorical research experiment titled The Island of the Day Before was led by postgraduate student Taylor Ray. Taylor based his project on a 1994 novel written by Italian author Umberto Eco called The Island of the Day Before. The narrator of the story is a man who is shipwrecked and alone on an abandoned ship anchored off the coast of a strange island. The island is sighted on the international dateline. The man realizes that because of its unique location, the island represents the future in one direction and the past in the other. As a real sight to tell this story through allegorical architecture, Taylor selected Wrangell Island. Located directly upon the international dayline, one half of Wrangell Island resides in the past, while the other half of the island resides in the future. Taylor considered what would happen if a work of architecture is located on the international dateline, looking to the past in one direction and the future in the other. To begin this investigation, Taylor allegorically situated Wrangell Island above Umberto Eco's book, The Island of the Day Before. He arranged the island so that the international dateline was above the line where the pages are hinged at the spine of the book. When reading a book, we can imagine that the left page, which we have already read, is in the past, while the right page that we are about to begin is in the future. The present is the spine of the book where the past and the future meet. To convey this idea architecturally, Taylor cut a line through Wrangell Island on the location of the International Day Line. Half of the island resides in the past and half of the island resides in the future. The past and the future look across the cut at one another, but they can never meet. Like the binding of a book, Taylor's machine-like architecture appears like a long set of stitches. Each stitch represents a type of allegorical machine. Their forms are all based on actual machines for navigating place and time, compasses, clocks, theodolites, and cartographic notation devices. Centuries ago, as the landscape of Wrangell Island rose upward and fragmented to become mountains, many of the stitches have allegorically broken. The stitches that have become broken are continually trying to repair themselves, and they reach down into the cut for support. The people of the island use the architectural infrastructure of the mechanical stitches as a vast transport network with trains on the upper levels, cable cars in the middle level, and boats at the bottom of the cut. Because the rising and falling tides move through the cut, continually rising up and down, the people see the cut as an enormous timepiece. In this way, the people recognize that the architecture is both witnessing and representing time itself the past and the present, the forever and the yet to come. The next allegorical research experiment is titled Under the Volcano and led by postgraduate student Louis McKissick. The site for this allegorical architectural project is White Island, New Zealand's most active volcano this island is a major tourist site, but on 9 December 2019, a tragedy occurred. There was a fatal eruption and 22 tourists were killed. The eruption removed the crater lake, formed new vents, and generated landslides into the active crater area. This design intends to safeguard and represent the tale of this disaster so that it will be remembered by future generations to come. When archeologists tell a story, they graphically separate larger areas into smaller ones. Their digging instruments carefully sift through the layers below. For this project, Louis began by reconfiguring archeological surveying instruments as habitable architecture. And he also graphically separated 
larger areas into smaller ones with his architecture. As the archeological excavation machine became more and more complex, it began to also represent an architectural drawing instrument, drawing its own plan. As the excavations began, the archeological machine cut through the multiple layers of ash. Each layer represents a unique period of time in the history of the volcano. And in order to understand the story of the present, we need to also unravel the stories of the past. The architecture also represents a timeline. The ripples of the ocean that crash onto the shore to the right meet the reverberations of the volcano that echo outward from the left. The architectural machine is sited on the locations where these eternal pulses originate, moving continually back and forth along the datum line. The program for this work of architecture is a memorial to the dead, meant to convey the story of deep loss when the 22 tourists were recently killed. At the same time, the architecture is a research laboratory for scientists to study the volcano. The scientists live in the central fulcrum of the machine while their laboratories are held in each of the armatures. The armatures continually move, tracing the scars upon the surface of the volcanic island and lifting up one layer after another over time. When visitors arrive upon the beach, they move along the timeline from the edge of the sea toward the center of the volcano. The machine frames the story of the tragedy before them. And at the same time, the machine continues to trace the scars upon the land and lift up the next layer that lies below. The machine slowly reveals the volcano's tragic tale hidden beneath the layers of fallen ash. The machine encourages dialogues between the volcano and the sea. Dialogues that are called out with reverberations and seismic interruptions. The next allegorical research experiment is titled The Book of the Machines and led by postgraduate student Courtney Roos. The site for this allegorical architectural project is the Chittagong Ship Graveyard in Bangladesh. This site is the second largest ship breaking yard in the world where mm -hmm. rusting cargo ships are taken to die. The ships are cut into fragments for scrap metal, leaving the enormous engines and the resulting pollutants upon the shoreline. The once beautiful beach is now inhabited by the industrial fragments of the ships and the great engines left behind. I will now play you a video that tells us more about this extraordinary site. These are the shipbreaking yards of Chittagong, Bangladesh. Shipbreaking is big business here. The industry began in the 1960s and grew to handle up to 50% of worldwide shipbreaking as recently as 2012. The industry employs over 200,000 Bangladeshis and provides over half of all the steel in the country. 
Shinagong is famous in the shipping industry, known as the place where ships go to die. And the yards were even featured in one of Marvel's Avengers movies. But there is a darker side to this industry. Shinagong was able to grow so quickly as a shipbreaking hub, largely because of its extremely cheap labor and low environmental standards. These two factors and others made Shinagong a highly affordable place for ship owners to but they also made shipbreaking in Bangladesh one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. In 2014, National Geographic published a story on Shinagong's shipbreaking industry and brought the reality of life in the yards to an international audience. They exposed thousands of workers with little to no formal training and almost no protective equipment. Most workers wore flimsy plastic flip-flops working for 12 to 16 hours a day. Rampant asbestos, ships filled with toxic chemicals, massive explosions, and falling chunks of metal all made working in the yards especially heavy. Amidst the fallout from the Nat Geo story, some shipping companies pledged to stop using the Chittagong yards altogether. And unsurprisingly, it also became a lot harder for outsiders to gain access to the yards. Today, conditions in the Chittagong yards remain far from perfect. According to The Guardian, as of 2017, only one yard in Bangladesh met international standards. Still, it appears that some improvements have been made. The few workers I got a look at for my drone appeared to be wearing hard hats and protective gear, and the few yards I tried to visit made sure to call out their compliance on signs outside their facilities. But there are over 80 privately owned shipbreaking yards in Chittagong, and conditions in the yards can vary. In Courtney's allegorical architectural design that she located on the site of the Chittagong ship graveyard, Courtney wanted her architecture to convey the sad story of this site. While these ships brought enormous prosperity to their owners, the people living in the ship graveyard were impoverished and working in toxic conditions. Courtney generated her ideas from a fictional novel written in 1872 by Samuel Butler called The Book of the Machines. In this book, the author predicts that the evolution of the machine will eventually overtake the evolution of mankind. And he predicts that eventually the dominance of the machine will lead to the complete destruction of our natural environment and we will no longer be able to survive. This is how Courtney's project conveys this story on the site of the Chittagong ship graveyard. In her allegorical architectural design, after the ships have been cut apart and the useful metal has been removed, the enormous engines remain behind, buried in the sand. Over time, the rise and fall of the tides unveils the engines and they come to life again. When mankind's overuse of machines eventually destroys the natural environment, these machine fragments become the homes of the impoverished workers who are the only people remaining alive on the earth. The machine now provides these people with an architectural sanctuary. Courtney built digital models of the engines of the actual ships, and she analyzed the forms of these machines to decide which zones imply vertical versus horizontal circulation, which zones imply modular versus widespan spaces, and which zones imply entries and windows. In this way, she was then able to create habitable architecture from the actual remnants of the mighty machines left behind. And as the tides continue to rise and fall, the habitable spaces appear and disappear over time. The experiments that I will show next all use an allegorical machine to tell a story about a house. The next allegorical research experiment is titled The Fall of the House of Usher, and it was led by postgraduate student Nick Mercer. Nick reinterprets the house in Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Fall of the House of Usher. Nick uses machine architecture to convey Edgar Allan Poe's universal narrative theme about how we are all born into innocence but the pressures of our daily lives gradually remove our innocence and lead to our corruption and eventual demise. Poe's short story describes an allegorical relationship between a decaying house 
and its dying occupants. Within the house is a library whose books are allegories of the characters who inhabit the house. In this sense, the occupants, the library, and the house are one. While Poe's short story reflects on the characters who are the inhabitants of the house, Nick's architectural research project reflects on the allegorical books that are the inhabitants of its library. Nick represents each of the books as an allegorical context. The books become the rooms of the house. As we arrive at the house and move along the corridor, we are able to look into each book that has become an imaginary architectural space. Each architectural book tells us another important tale about our lives that we need to remember. One room represents a book about time. Another room represents a book about heaven and hell. Another room represents a book about utopia. There is a room that represents a book about subterranean voyages. There is a book about demonic possession. And three of the rooms represent books that predict the future. As representations of our lives, the books in this library rise up out of a place of darkness, finding a way to rise above the darkness and into the light. To do this, the library is represented as an enormous machine. If you look at the individual pieces of the machine, some parts are about our ability to move ahead, while other parts allow us to pause and reflect. One piece of the machine acts as a bookmark. It continually moves back and forth, inserting its armatures into the books to mark the pages that allegorically represent the place in our life's story that we have reached so far. The books are held together by a giant machine gantry that acts as bookends. One end of the gantry is on the brink of collapse and several of the books have already partially fallen away or broken apart. The machine of the gantry moves back and forth, replacing new books with new stories, while the older books enter into states of decay and their stories are lost. This is the universal tale about all of our lives that the architecture conveys to us and the architecture as a machine represents, as well as narrates, the book's allegorical tales that make up our lives. The next architectural research experiment is titled The Inflected Landscape and is led by postgraduate student, Sam Ferguson. Architectural theorist, Mark Tribe, uses the phrase inflected landscape as a way to think about how architecture and the landscape share a formally and conceptually blurred relationship to one another. A work of architecture needs to actively contribute to the enhancement of the landscape, and the landscape needs to actively contribute to the enhancement of the work of architecture. Student Sam Ferguson's design for the inflected landscape proposes that the integral relationship between architecture and the landscape is similar to the dynamics of a machine. In this way, for example, the allegorical concept of machine architecture can help inform us about the underlying stories of how erosion makes a landscape appear in a particular way. The architecture can be made to appear as if it is preventing further erosion of the site. 
or it can be made to appear as if it is a natural participant in the dynamics of the site. Sam began by creating a matrix of landscapes, ranging from a very flat site to an extremely steep and highly eroded site. He then created machine-like allegorical designs that appear as if they are actively interacting with each unique landscape and conveying its unique story. Each of his architectural experiments appears to be capable of moving like a machine, even though they're actually static. When we look at his early designs, we recognize that the implied movement of the architecture suggests that the architecture is preventing the landscape from falling. Other examples suggest that the architecture may have been shifted by the dynamic movement of the land over time. By allegorically taking ideas from the machine, the work of architecture fully integrates into the landscape while playing an important role in conveying its ongoing tale. The final allegorical research experiment is titled The House Without Walls, and it is led by postgraduate student Henry Maven. This allegorical architectural project investigates how the house can be represented as the series of sacred rituals in which we engage every day. If we can consider the program of a house as being composed of the sacred rituals of cleansing, sleeping, nourishing, and engaging with others, then the house can be transformed into a sacred space where rooms and walls no longer need to exist. Henry considers that each element of a house's program should be understood as one of the inhabitants of the house. So he began by designing each programmatic element as an individual machine that enables a particular ritual to unfold. The first machine that inhabits the house is called the guardian. The second is the eating chamber. The third is the bedroom. The fourth is the rest chamber. The fifth is the hearth. These machines stand next to one another and engage in dialogues across the thresholds that separate them. The master plan of the house was designed like a sacred mandala. The four principal rituals inhabit four realms of the sacred space. One realm is defined by fire, one by water, one by air, and one by earth. The machines were then located within the sacred spaces. The plan of the house has rail lines and gantries so that the machines can move from one area of the house to another. The machines can also fold and unfold, revealing and concealing their purpose. The architectural drawings show how every unique machine can function as a sacred space to fulfill the programmatic requirements of the house. Here is the bedroom where the bed can slide outside the house on a warm summer night to lie adjacent to a pool of water. Here is the kitchen where the table folds up or down and the entire kitchen can move on tracks to be indoors or outdoors. Here is the shower room, which becomes an indoor garden fountain when it is not in use for bathing. When all of the individual machines come together, they form one larger mechanical system. The family members move through the house, encouraging it to transform to meet their individual needs. 
the house without walls becomes a place where we can dream together, imagine together, and reinvent our lives. It encourages us to wonder and to enter into other realms of the imagination. In the examples of machine architecture produced by my postgraduate students, some of the projects use the machine to tell us a story about how we live. Other projects use works of architecture to tell allegorical tales, scarred landscapes, and the devastation that occurs when the built environment attempts to subjugate the natural environmental systems. The machine has played a vital role in both the advancement as well as the degradation of our environmental, political, economic, and social realms. This apparent contradiction situates the machine simultaneously as both protagonist and antagonist in dialectic narratives within the allegorical architectural project. <laughs> 